We now know with absolute certainty that a temperature rise of two degrees above pre-industrial uh, pre uh, temperature will result in, for example, the incomplete wipeout of all coral reefs. It will leave 100 to 400 million people at risk of, of hunger and will leave uh, 1 to 2 billion people uh, without adequate water supply. And we are predicted to arrive at that two degree limit um, by 2100. So in 80 years from now, uh, that's the scale of the challenge. the reluctance by governments and the executive to restrain those emissions. It, it's, it's something that, uh, this is all of what I've just said and all of what Professor Olson has just, has just said, um, coalesces in the National Mitigation Plan. Um, this was adopted in 2017, and the National Mitigation Plan actually approved an increase of emissions over the lifetime of the plan. I just, uh, just allow that thought to just coalesce in your head for a minute. The National Mitigation Plan in light of all that we know about greenhouse gas emissions and the effects of climate change, the plan passed by the state actually envisaged an increase of 10% in emissions over the lifetime of the plan. And there's, you can pick a number of examples of where we've gone so badly wrong, but I'll just give you four. Firstly, uh, it is a, a policy to increase the national dairy herd by 50% uh, under the uh, Food Harvest 2020. The Minister for Climate Action expressed his profound disappointment that a peat-fired power station was going to cease operation uh, next year rather than 2030 because an environmental NGO had intervened to point out the insanity of, bur of burning peat. Thirdly, the uh, Government is continuing to express its report, support for the Shannon LNG gas terminal, in, uh, which is maybe built in, in County Kerry, despite uh, absolutely unequivocal evidence to the Joint Oireachtas Committee that greenhouse gas emissions from the imported LNG, which comes, will come from fracking in the United States, will be approximately 50% more carbon intensive than the coal equivalent, and we all know just how bad coal is. And finally, the state's own Climate Change Advisory Council described our emissions as frankly disturbing. So that's where we are, because where the executive is incapable or unwilling to step in to restrain these consequences, uh, human rights gets pushed, um, willingly or not, into the, into, the forefront, into the forefront of the debate. Sorry, each and every human right, major human right, is breached by the possibility or by the consequences of greenhouse gas emissions. Secondly, human rights is the tool by which um, traditionally we have restrained uh, executive inaction. It should be the perfect tool to address uh, the issue in which, uh, in, or the, the difficulties in which we find ourselves. And then the final thing. It struck me when I was uh, in, in the High Court in, in the climate case, um, when the court was packed to capacity by people who have no uh, understanding or engagement with the legal system and who regard it as a largely alien concept that's done by other people in dusty courtrooms uh, and that they don't greatly understand. Uh, it really did strike me that we as lawyers and, uh, and as barristers in particular have a particular skill to transmit very complex things in understandable and comprehensible format. And I think that's a skill that we can usefully apply, whether through litigation, whether through engagement with, broader society, with, with civil society, um, in order to advance um, public understanding of this crisis, in order to build consensus, in order to diffuse tensions. Um, it is something that uh, I, I think we as barristers uh, can, do, can usefully do um, uh, as, as we move to try and address the unique challenges raised by, by climate change. And I commend the, the, the Special Rapporteur's report. I'm very much pleased. <laughs>